Hello, welcome to Democratic Dialogue. I'm David Rhinelander. The, I'm going to be the uh, questioner, questioner today. My guest is Dr. Rich Sagel, who is a retired uh, family practitioner who lives here in Gloucester and now runs, founded and runs a wonderful program called Needy Meds. Our topic today is the whole issue of health care coverage and how to improve it, how to get Americans better coverage. And uh, Rex, why don't you introduce yourself and then we can, uh, then I can grill you. <laughs> well, as David said, I'm a retired family physician, practice family medicine and occupational medicine for 25 years in Bangor, Maine, and also in Philadelphia. Moved here with my wife about 10 years ago. Founded Needy Meds approximately 20 years ago. We just had our 20th anniversary in earlier this month. And we've grown from a virtual operation with two or three people to 31 people here employed in Gloucester. We have information on programs that help people who can't afford medications and health care costs. It's a national program. We're a national program. Mm -hmm. We have data on probably 25 or 30,000 different programs. The website, which is needymeds.org, receives about, ten, about 12 to 14,000 unique visitors most weekdays, and our call center handles about 6,000 calls a month. And its purpose is to provide meds for people who don't know where to get them or can't afford them? or how, We provide explain, information, information about programs that will help not, people. Not meds themselves. Yeah. We, don't, we don't supply yes. medications. We supply right. information. information. Right. So people mm -hmm. can find information if they qualify to get their meds for free or a low cost. We have programs that help with other types of equipment, durable medical equipment, uh, CPAP machines, wigs, et cetera, et cetera. We have camps, scholarships, and retreats based on diagnosis, state programs based mm -hmm. on diagnosis, coupons, et cetera. So there's a lot of information there, a lot of ways to save on health care costs. Wow. So this leads me right into uh, what do we do nationally now? And I will, I, I personally, as a, as a Democrat, I like... Uh, you hold affordable health care uh, slant that's going on, and I just want let's talk about that kind of thing. So, well, I, I agree with you. I like ACA, despite all of its faults. It's better than what we had, and I think that we need to accept the fact that health care is a right. It's not a privilege, and everyone should have access to it. And we need to figure out a way to make it more economical, more reasonable, more affordable in this country. And how would you go about that? How would I go about it? Well, I think that if you look at things, we really need to have a single payer. You look at the amount of money spent on administration alone for private insurance, which depending upon who you believe is 18 to 20 percent of the dollars they right. collect. Right. Compare that to Medicare, which is 2 to 4 percent. And if we switch to single payer right away, we'd have a big savings. We'd have a lot more money to spend on what we need to spend on, which is health care. And I'm, I'm uh, in, in in one sense, I think what the Senator Saunders talked about was is going down the right track, but there may well be faults in in his his program. Let's can you talk about some of that? How would you do it, and what kind of program would you set up? To I make it? I don't I don't have the answer to that. There, are, if you look around the world, there are multiple different programs. There are yeah. some like the British system, which is totally run by the government. Right. There are other programs that are run by private insurers, but funded by the government. Um, there's combinations of all of those different programs. I think it's also important to recognize the difference between the program plan, how it would work, and the funding for it. You could have a wonderful program, but it'd be underfunded the way it's happened in some countries. So it wouldn't work, yes. So it wouldn't work, and people <laughs> yeah. complain about the program when it's really right. the funding that's, mm -hmm. that's inadequate. Mm -hmm. But I think the concept of single payer makes a lot of sense. And what would you do, what, what would insurance companies' roles be? Because you, and I, you know better than I do, insurance companies have a major voice and political uh, strength in trying to put things their way. They don't want to be cut out of the loop. Right, they don't want to be unemployed. Exactly. Well, different countries do it differently. Some of them have, just like you can buy your Medicare supplement, so they provide the basic health insurance, and if you want to get all the bells and whistles, you pay extra, and that's provided by private companies. Other countries, they have a, that the private insurers have to offer a certain package of benefits. as a standard package of benefits at a standard price. 
and they're not allowed to make more than a very small margin of profit on that. And then they can also do the add-ons, and that's where they make their money. But so there's they're, different they're critical add-ons, or they're, I mean, what's an add-on? In, in it might be you would include cosmetic surgery. Oh. It might include infertility. I, it, again, it varies okay. Okay. from country to country. So you really can't talk about a program. There's multiple different programs. I think it's important that we recognize that our healthcare system does not provide the best health in the world. Right. We should, and we could, but we don't. I think the last time I read it was something like 17th. Yeah, and why is that Why is that today? I think it's because of some of the inequities. It's easy if you look across the total health care situation to come up with a number in terms of mortality, I mean, infant mortality, let's say, or neonatal mortality, mm -hmm. or maternal mortality. But you look in certain parts of the country, some of the inner city regions, our, our numbers are worse in many developing countries. Yes so that it's, it's not gonna be a simple solution and we have to get equitable health care offered to everybody. But single payer, is, the, is, is that the way to go? I think it's the way to go. It just eliminates a lot of expenses. Right. When I was in practice, about a quarter of my staff was involved with billing. Really? It's a lot of money to spend. Hmm. When if you simplify the process, you don't have to do that and the money can go to pay for the health care that's needed. Hmm. I think we need to educate consumers as to what's good health care, what's necessary, what isn't. Some people run to the doctor at the drop of the hat, others don't go when they should. And a lot of people don't do preventive. Don't preventive, is preventive, an inter stairs. preventive is an interesting issue. Um, we're still learning, medicine is still learning what is really good preventative care, what is good screening. We used to do a lot of things that we don't do anymore. Right. I remember the days you get a complete physical with routine blood work and x-ray an EKG, urine test, et cetera. And that's really been and, and various shown. Po and various poking around. <laughs> poking around, and it's been shown not to make a difference. People exactly. forget, why do you do a screening test? Yeah. You do a screening test to find a disease in its pre-symptomatic stages where early diagnosis and treatment can makes a difference. Early treatment, yes, exactly. Well, not that it can learn to early treatment, but early treatment makes a difference. Right, right. And we're learning that a lot of things we thought early treatment made a difference for, it doesn't. And we spend a lot of money on useless things. Mm. For, for instance? Well, there's a whole debate about mammograms. Yes, that's right, yes. And okay. the big debate as to whether women should have them, when they should have them, how frequently they should have them. Do at they what move, age? And do at they they what stop? age? Yeah. Yeah. Do they really lessen the incidence? Does early diagnosis make a difference? And one of the problems, particularly with breast disease, with breast cancer, is I like to say there is no such thing as breast cancer. There are breast cancers. There are multiple different cancers that occur in the breast. For some breast cancers, early diagnosis and treatment makes a big difference. For others, unfortunately, it makes no difference. No difference, yeah. And teasing that out and learning the difference and learning what, when a test is appropriate. We tend in this country, when there's a new test, do it for everybody. And we don't know if it really makes a difference or not. And it's the same with treatment. Many treatments don't make any difference. Or they make a marginal difference. Is an expensive treatment worthwhile for somebody who has terminal cancer where it's going to extend their life by maybe an average of a month? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And that's a difficult question to answer. Yeah. I don't have the answer to that, but those are things that we need to look at. There's any place, I mean, that's a good question, uh, extending life. Is that a, uh, I think sometimes that's, that's um, the wrong thing to do. I mean, I think hospice and that kind of thing are, are a good way to, a good kind of program to have. But, I think uh, I think health care and medicine in this country realize, has to realize that, first of all, you're going to lose every patient. You're never going to win in the long run. Everybody dies. <laughs> yes. So we're, but, we're going to lose in the end. But that doesn't, well, but you see. And, and okay. maybe we have to redefine losing. Yes, th exactly. Because, I mean, physicians think, I remember when I was an old medical writer, as you know, and I used to talk to physicians about that, and you're right. It was a loss instead of a quiet, uh, gentle death, which I thought was a was something they should work for, just as well as keeping everybody alive. But uh, I was Definitely. telling David, the oath is to uh, you know <laughs> keep them alive. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you, and that's why hospice is so important. Right. That's why the whole death with dignity movement is so important. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You reach a point where you're not going to get any better. You're only going to get worse. And people should have the right to make some decisions as to what they want to do at that point. 
right? How difficult do you think it'll be politically to get both the medical and the whole health in industry and the people on the, basically on the same page and work together to go forward? Because we, we have to cooperate uh, to go forward. I think it's going to be easier for doctors to accept this in patients. Oh. I think the doctors, more and more doctors are understanding we're going to, eventually patients are going to die. You can't okay. do everything. You also learn that you can't cure everything. Some things are just going to be there and you can't cure them all. Right. You know, pain is an interesting problem, particularly with the opioid epidemic, overdose epidemic, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I always used to tell patients, these pills, these pain pills, are not going to take your pain away. You only see that in commercials. <laughs> they're going to take the edge off it. They're going to make you a little more comfortable, but oh, they're not yes. going to take the pain away totally. Completely away. No, that's true. Sure. And yeah. that's, what, Good that's point. the expectations you see. Good point. You see all the ads on TV for drugs. We're only one of two countries that allow drug advertising on TV. Is that right? The other one's New Zealand. Oh. And one of the complaints I've heard from people who suffer, for example, from rheumatoid arthritis, you see these ads on TV where someone takes the drug and they're 100%. They're running around, hiking, swimming, doing everything. And people with rheumatoid, that doesn't happen. They get better. They can do more. But not everybody gets to that level. Well, and some people learn to hike with, with some pain. With pain, I mean, exactly. You I learn. go to the PT, and I'm told, because I have various things, and, and they say, you, you know, it used to be, I, I thought there was sort of an old cliche about, well, if it doesn't hurt, it means we're not pushing you hard enough. And they say, no, go up to the point that it hurts. And then stop. That's right. And you have to. That's a that point. Fortunately, get, I mean, my arm can get higher and higher slowly, but I can't put it all the way up. And you have to push yourself with just a little bit. Exactly. And you know what PT stands for? Pain and torture. Pain and torture. torture. Yes, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to keep that in mind, but you do have to keep pushing yourself. Yeah. And they have to gently push you. Gently. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But we have unrealistic expectations yeah. as to what healthcare is going to do, and it just doesn't work that way. How can we, uh, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right, but the question now is how do we educate the public? Because it certainly has become a big political issue, as you know better than I do, uh, with this whole business of Obamacare and uh, killing it and not letting it die. And Well, the easiest and way to educate the public is let them have a health catastrophe and go broke. Then they're going to change <laughs> their mind. You know, I, I wrote this article that was posted on the Needy Meds blog talking about health insurance. Yes. And one yes. of the things I mentioned is yes. you never win with health insurance. When you buy health insurance, either you're healthy, so you figure you spend all this money and get nothing out of it, or you get sick. Yeah. And then you're sick. So you really always lose with health insurance. What you should be attaining with health insurance is a level of confidence or peace of mind that if you get really sick, you're not going to go broke. Yeah. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen in this country. Well, even, even not just broke, but even, even just take out a few thousand dollars, it hurts you from doing other things. I mean, I have, my retirement includes, includes health insurance. I've had both knees and a hip and various other things done. And if I had to pay every penny for the surgeries I've had, I'd be broke. Right. So it, it does, it is important. But it, I, uh, and, or I would have to stop taking, you know, there are people, as you know better than I do, poor people who give up food and things like this to pay for their medical expenses. Or put off the treatment. I had exactly. many cases uh, yes, exactly. when, I, when I was in practice of people who delayed treatment knowing there was something seriously wrong. But they, they couldn't buy the, the meds, yeah. They didn't want their family to go broke. Yeah. Roughly half of middle class bankruptcies are due to medical expenses in this country. Uh -huh. And that just shouldn't be. Wow, absolutely, absolutely. And what did you, when you had patients like that in your practice up in Maine, what did you do? I would refer them to the appropriate care. Some of them would go, some wouldn't. I mean, I had a, a few women who knew they had a lump, a breast lump, and delayed treatment until they got insurance. Mm -hmm. And by then it was too late. Mm -hmm. Now, things have improved somewhat. But still, there's a lot of people who don't have health insurance, don't have good health insurance. $5,000 deductible is not much health insurance. It'll wow. help you for the catastrophic thing. Yes, yes. That's why it's called catastrophic insurance. Exactly. But, but not, the, not the monthly thing. Not exactly. the monthly thing. Exactly. It's yeah. as we were discussing earlier. Yeah. Those people are what we call functionally uninsured. They oh, have yes. health insurance. But it isn't. <laughs> but it doesn't really do 
take help with the day-to-day -day issues that you have. Yeah. Now we're moving in that direction, and hopefully we will continue to move towards better coverage. You know, what's happened in the Senate is good and that things didn't get torn apart. Um, you know, I, I like to say Democrats care for the masses, Republicans are selfish and care for themselves. But there, there were issues with Obamacare that uh, I think there were some genuine issues. Oh, there were genuine issues with it because there was a compromise. Yes, yes. And I think the original intent was different than what we had, what we ended up with, but that's our pol political system, at least until recently. Right. Where we do have to compromise and move slowly. Right, right. Another important fact is people forget that roughly half of health care expenses are already paid by the government. Through Medicare. Medicare, Medicaid, VA, etc. Mm -hmm. So we're halfway there. And the people that are in those systems mostly don't want to get out of them. You don't but see I have, too many people turning down Medicare. I've met a gap insurance which took care of the stuff that wasn't covered. You know? Right. And boy, what a, what a huge difference. That, that made in my, it does. <laughs> my wallet. It definitely <laughs> does. So we don't have a perfect system by any means, but yeah. we're, ha we're halfway there. Yeah, yeah. Now tell me about, about needy meds. What, uh, these are people who, who uh, cannot afford uh, medicines, or what's the... Well, in the interesting thing with needy meds is that the programs we list have all different various eligibility requirements. They're usually based on income, family size, residency, whether, they're le whether the person is a legal resident or citizen or not, oh. sometimes diagnosis, and, uh, and often medicine specifically. Right. But we have information on thousands of programs that help people. So there's a right. type of program called a pharmaceutical patient assistance program. These programs that are sponsored by the pharma manufacturers give away billions of dollars worth of drugs every year to people who qualify. Now, we run into a problem at needy meds, and some people say, well, I'm not needy. <laughs> you could take a family of four making... I don't want to call myself needy. You yeah, don't right. want exactly. <laughs> yeah. You could take a family of four making, with a family income of maybe $70,000, $80,000. They would qualify for some of the programs we list on the website. Mm. Nobody mm. would call that family poor. Right. They may be going paycheck to paycheck, right. but they're not poor, but yet they would qualify for assistance. So we encourage people to go to the website, which again is needymeds.org, to look through all the different types of programs we have. On the website is our toll-free number. If you have questions, you can call, and we're happy to and those walk you through come, the process. come to Gloucester? They all come to Gloucester, about 6,000 calls a month. Wow, okay. So that's what we do. We're always adding new information. And are there different programs in, in, in the 50 different states? Or, uh, we, have a de we have a database of state programs that help by diagnosis. We have about 1,200 of those listed. But I mean, are they diff there is a big difference nationally between... There are different programs, exactly. Yeah. Some states... Are more generous and some less. And, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So a national program would make a big difference. Right. We, we list national programs. We list, list regional programs. We list local programs. Um, we have a section called Diagnosis-Based Assistance. These are programs that help people based upon the diagnosis. So we have all different types of data. We also offer a free drug discount card. Oh. This card is saving people up to 80% off the cash price of prescriptions that you buy in the pharmacy. Wow. Now, the who, local pharmacy. where do you guys get the money to uh Well, to we cover pride ourselves, and we never charge individuals for anything. Right. So over the years... We've developed a number of lines of, of income, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. We get some grants and donations. So if you would like to make this the David Rhinelander <laughs> helpline, we could talk about that after the show. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, we have a couple of very carefully selected advertisers on the website. Then we license our information. We make some money off the drug card. We help pharmaceutical companies design, implement, and will actually run their patient assistance programs. Mm. Um, so those are some of the ways that we earn income. But we've been fortunate that we've been able to, as I said, give away everything free to individuals. We never charge individuals for mm. any of the help we provide. Mm. There are places that will charge for the same information we give away. So we want people to come to us and get it for free. Yeah. So this is a good national model. It's a good national model. It's a stopgap. Ideally, needy meds mm. would not exist because everybody can get the health care that they need at a reasonable cost. But I don't see that changing for a while. I don't see that happening. Yeah. So we're going to continue to be around. 
We're expanding into other areas, looking into more health education. We run a, a website called Safe Needle Disposal, which has information on how to safely and legally dispose of used shops in every state. That's right, yes, I remember that. We yeah. have that. We have another one called Health Web Navigator. We're still wor building that one up, but it's up and running, which has reviews of health-related websites in terms of usability and in terms of the accuracy Oh, really? And currency so you, of the content. You may get into some boxing matches then, eh? Yes. We may. We may. <laughs> so that if you find a website That's and you wonder about it, you can see if, it, if we've reviewed it. If not, let us know and we will review it. So you go to Bob's Cancer Cure. We'll tell you whether it's, it's good information or yeah. not. And there are a lot of now uh, health food kind of uh, programs saying if you only had this diet or only took our... our uh, mm -hmm. There are. There's a, there's a lot of foods that you'd be you'd be cured. Do you look at those kinds of things too? We've looked at some. There's a lot of nutritional misinformation out there. Most of it is probably misinformation. Deliberately or just? Uh, how do you know? I mean, how do you? I think some of it is deliberate mm -hmm. because they want to sell their products. Yeah, I think so too. But I'm and just and some wondering. of it is because it's very difficult to do good nutritional research. Yeah, it's tough to put people on specific diets and keep them on those diets. A lot of nutritional research is retrospective, looking back and saying, well, now, David, how many times did you eat red meat in the last month? Right. Can you give a reasonable answer? You can make a guess. <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> you know, th there's just a lot of misinformation about nutrition, and we have a lot to learn. So you talk about the Mediterranean diet, for example. Exactly. I was going to ask you that, yeah. You're yeah. taking one aspect of a person's lifestyle and examining the diet. You need to, maybe you need to look at the climate, Maybe you need to look at the philosophy of life there, the exercise, exercise all these, all these whether things, the country yes. is more, does yeah. more exercising in na in yeah. by nature. The quality of the water. The quality all. of the <laughs> yeah. water. Yeah. I mean, you can go on, on and on and on. 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 Exactly. So that yeah. you can't just change things like that. Yeah. And again, like I say, lots of misinformation. Um, for example, GMOs. GMOs make a big difference for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. There's never been a good study that showed a harm from a GMO food. Really? I have never seen one. Never? Never. Wow. And I also feel that it's really a, there's an ethical issue there. It's a first world problem GMO. For example, one of the major causes of blindness in children is vitamin A deficiency in the developing world. Mm. There is the golden rice, I believe it's called, which has a significant increase in the amount of vitamin A and mm. it produces a lot more rice for the when you grow it isn't there an ethical issue to give but, it to the yes. <laughs> to the people who, yeah. who are vitamin A deficient and starving because they don't have enough rice yeah yeah interesting how do you how do you know so much Where, who's been teaching you for all the, all these years well i think part of it is a medical education you learn a certain degree of skepticism you look in the medical history, you, as a medical reporter, you've probably seen this over time. Things were very big, and then all of a sudden they changed. They changed, absolutely. They got thrown out. And, and different, different medical, I mean, I was in Connecticut. You know, Yale Medical School had, a, had certain things, and I grew up here about Harvard, and they'd say something else, and I'd, That's right. I'd get stuck in the middle. You There's know? a lot we don't know. <laughs> the, the story goes that every medical student, the first day, the first lecture, the professor says, half of what I teach you is going to be wrong, totally and completely wrong. We just don't know which half. <laughs> and things change. Now, wait a minute, Doc. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, true, though. Really I remember talking true. to my father, who was a cardiologist. My grandfather was, he really? yeah, was yeah. A, uh, a physician also, and the things they used to do. Sure. Did you? And I had the same experience, things you had yeah. to do. It was exactly. malpractice if you didn't do them. Exactly. Became malpractice if you did them. Exactly, yeah. Because my, we just learned more. My father was an orthopod. And he trained at Mass General, and the, his practice over the decades just was so different. I mean, That's right. Absolutely amazing. It changes yeah. quite a bit. So it, it's, it's hard to know. And that's one of the things I hope in the reforms, there's a door open so that, because you don't say, right now you're going to have to do it this way. Because as you just said, next year it may be a different way. And I'm afraid in some of these people who are trying to reform, and clamp down and say, okay, this is the way to do it from now on. It's in the law. We'll make an awful, that could be an awful error. I'm not sure I agree. Okay. I think that, that for many conditions that we run into, there is a best way to treat it based right. upon the current knowledge that we have. Right. And that's the way it should be. 
Yeah. Physicians should be allowed to deviate, but they have to justify. Right. No, that's what I mean. I mean, I don't think I don't think you want to write the law that says there has to be, you know, you can't make it too strict because, as you say, next year or five it may be years different. Now, it may be very different. Yeah. Well, that that's why it needs to be left up to the medical group, not the legislature. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, uh, we got we're sort of running out of time here, but um, fascinating. Do you do you see uh, that, that we're going in the right direction? Do you are you feeling more optimistic now than than you were five years ago, or when you were up in Bangor practicing? I was very optimistic when the ACA became the law. Mm. It really depends upon what the people in power do to that, and whether they gut it, starve it, or expand it. Yeah. But I think that, that the current trend towards trying to cut back on things they don't understand insurance, they don't understand people. And what they what they go through. Well, Ma Massachusetts had you know had uh, right, and they we have one the of the one, leaders of, of uh, and one of the lowest uninsured rates in the country. Exactly. I think we yeah. compete with Hawaii. Yeah, which has some sort of statewide program also. So it has gotten better. It's gotten better in some areas, but you go down to the south, it's pretty poor. Mm. Mm. So are you optimistic at, at your age, or uh? <laughs> am I optimistic? Guardedly optimistic. Ask me after the next election. <laughs> <laughs> if you could dictate, what would you do as a dictator? <laughs> what would I do? Probably abdicate. Um, <laughs> in terms of this area, I would go for single payer mm -hmm. as a first step, accepting health care as a right, not a privilege. Good. Yeah. And establishing the basic health care access and what people are allowed can get without any difficulty. Mm -hmm. And somehow or other imposed and, and make sure that that was the way we went. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. We, I don't, I don't know which of the multiple systems we see throughout the world is the best, but okay. we need to do something other than what we have. Well, ours is among the worst. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, Rich, listen, thank you very much. I think this has been fascinating. Um, I'm a little more optimistic than I was, <laughs> and I frankly think Senator Sanders is on the right path. But um, where we'll go. As you said, I don't know, but the fact that that the the reform didn't make it, so-called reform didn't make it, I think is positive. So uh, thank you, and thank you all for watching. This has uh, been a very interesting discussion about healthcare, and uh, we here on Democratic Dialogues are very glad to uh, explore these kinds of uh, these kinds of issues. So, uh, Dr. Sagal, thank you, sir, and. Uh, We'll talk again, and thank you all for, for watching. Mm -hmm.